enormous pleasure for me to be here and to share with you uh, research on my newest project, which deals with a topic that is both current and perennial, uh, the topic of lying in politics. What I will say today I hope will be provocative uh, in the sense that it is, to a certain extent, a defense of political mendacity. Uh, and I hope uh, at least some of the arguments will uh, provoke you to respond in a spirited way. Untruth and consequences screamed the headline on the cover of the July 21st, 2003 issue of Time magazine, which dealt extensively with the then burning question, how flawed was the case for going to war against Saddam Hussein. Once again, it seemed that an American president was in danger of losing his credibility and being excoriated for the sin of telling lies to the American people. Only a short time after his predecessor had been impeached for perjuring himself about his sex life, leaving, as the title of Christopher Hitchens' nasty Philippic put it, no one left to lie to, George W. Bush was struggling to parse his way out of the discrepancies between his statements about the imminent threat of Iraqi weapons of mass destruction and what the evidence now seemed to show. Once again, outrage against political mendacity coursed, albeit variably depending on whose ox had been caught fibbing, through the American public sphere. Liberals like Al Franken could hit the bestseller lists by calling their polemics lies and the lying liars who tell them a fair and balanced look at the right. In response to conservative rants like Ann Coulter's slander, liberal lies about the American right. And critics of Bush's war on Iraq could name their books with easy cleverness, Weapons of Mass Deception. Not surprisingly, a political culture that takes as one of its founding myths the refusal of its chief founding father to lie about the felling of a cherry tree and fondly calls its most revered leader Honest Abe has been especially keen on rooting out mendacity from the political sphere. In fact, American culture in general, as Michael T. Gilmore has recently reminded us in a book called Surface and Depth, American culture in general has been on a dogged quest for perfect legibility, fueled by a yearning for full disclosure that stretches from the Puritans' anti-monastic insistence on holy watching to the widespread acceptance of psychoanalysis as a therapy of unconstrained candor. Although admiring the arts of deception in the popular culture of what has been called the age of Barnum, when it came to extending them to political discourse, strict limits were set. Not for us Americans prided themselves on believing, not for us on the Machiavellian machinations of old world politics, with their haughty disdain for the transparency of democratic decision making. Not for us are the even more dangerous deceptions of totalitarian ideology based on the imposition of the big lie on a supine populace no longer able to tell the difference between truth and falsehood. We are determined, as the reigning cliche now has it, quote, to speak truth to power. In the academy, ever since Harvard picked its familiar motto, which is veritas, a comparable assumption is ruled that truth, or at least the quest for it, is an unimpeachable value. Interestingly, that motto was originally Veritas pro Christo et Ecclesia, truth for Christ and his church, but was shortened to allow other, more profane purposes to be served by that quest. When the secularization of intellectual life undermined appeals to divinely revealed truth, this often came to mean a surrogate faith in the scientific method, however that might be defined as a viable alternative. 
even when American pragmatists questioned traditional notions of certainty and referential correspondence, they did not abandon the search for truth as the telos, the goal of inquiry and action. With the growth of departments of political science, often adopting the approach that came to be called behavioralist, the appeal to honesty in political practice could be reinforced by a comparable attempt to study politics in a disinterested and neutral way. At times, in fact, some came to believe that technocrats, with the tools of political science at their command, would be the best leaders of a polity that wanted to avoid the untidiness of ill-informed opinion and untested prejudice. During the progressive era in particular, the period from about 1890 through 1914, during the progressive era in particular, advocates of scientific administration like Walter Lippmann and L.L. L. Bernard advocated organization, efficiency, and enlightened management. Truth in politics, it was argued, would be achieved by transcending the cacophony of competing voices and allowing those with the skills and knowledge to cut through to the core of problems and deal with them effectively. At the heart of this project was a desire to strip political language of its irrational, emotive, and ornamental excrescences, and find a way to express ideas, arguments, and motivations with full clarity and univocal meaning. Formal eloquence and elevated diction were stigmatized by being identified with a gentlemanly code of stuffy decorum that seemed outdated in the era of plain speech and colloquial idiom. If common men and women looked up to anyone now, it was the technical expert rather than the literary stylist. And even if this goal did not entail imposing a neutral scientific language on the messiness of everyday speech, it was still widely held to be a powerful tool in the campaign against mendacity in the public realm. No more rhetorically powerful expression of this distrust of the dangers of unchecked rhetoric can be found in the celebrated essay that I'm sure, I'm sure many of you know by George Orwell that quickly established itself as a touchstone of political truth-telling on both sides of the Atlantic, his essay, Politics and the English Language of 1946. Widely anthologized, incessantly taught in schools, and cited with numbing frequency, Orwell's essay claimed that a debased, impure, inflated, euphemistic, pretentious, cliche-ridden language was more than a symptom of political decline. It was one of its main causes. In our time, he lamented, and I'm citing him, in our time, political speech and writing are largely the defense of the indefensible. Political language, and with variations this is true of all parties, from conservatives to anarchists, political language is designed to make lies sound truthful and murder respectable, and to give an appearance of solidity to pure wind." End quote. Avoid stale figures of speech, unnecessarily long words, the passive voice, foreign phrases, and abstrusive jargon, he argued, abstruse jargon, he argued, uh, and perhaps the wind would then die down. When Orwell's great novel, 1984, added a brilliant exposition of the ways in which totalitarianism depended on the deliberate lies of new speak and double think, Orwell's reputation as the saint of liberal democratic honesty was augmented. By 1955, commentators like Lionel Trilling could describe him in worshipful terms, and I quote Trilling. He told the truth, and told it in an exemplary way, quietly, simply, with due warning to the reader that it was only one man's truth. He used no political jargon, and he made no recriminations. He made no effort to show that his heart was in the right place or the left place. 
He was not interested in where his heart might be thought to be, since he knew where it was. He was interested only in telling the truth. And what matters most of all is our sense of the man who tells the truth." End quote from Lionel Trilling. Now, although since Trilling's time, Orwell has been subjected to considerable scrutiny and not all of it flattering, which has uncovered some of his own less attractive biases, his critique of linguistic obfuscation and its political consequences has become itself a standard trope in political rhetoric. For both the right and the left, his legacy has been a ready source of epithets against their allegedly deceitful opponents. In the words of Hannah Pitkin, Orwell stood for the, quote, truth of witness, in which it was incumbent on the reporter to tell the facts of the story as they are. It's thus not surprising to find Orwell remaining a heroic model for self-proclaimed scourges of mendacity in the public realm, like Christopher Hitchens, who have bounced from one camp to another. Hitchens, uh, Hitchens has a recent book uh, called Why Orwell Matters. But what has also occurred, and this is the main point of this talk, what has also occurred is a growing undercurrent of uncertainty about the wholesale embrace of the values of linguistic purification and unvarnished truth-telling, at least in the political arena. Much of that uncertainty, I want to argue, has been fueled by receptiveness to ideas from Europe, which have permeated at least a portion of the American consciousness in the latter decades of the 20th century and which remain potent into our own. Broadly speaking, these involve what has been called the linguistic turn, which includes inter alia, among other things, a new respect for rhetoric, an acceptance of the necessity of hermeneutic interpretation, and a willingness to tolerate the inconclusive deconstruction of univocal meaning. Because truth itself seems so difficult to attain, the value of truth-telling, truthfulness, veracity, veridiction, we might call it, is implicitly called into question, as inherently aesthetic notions of language as more a tool of linguistic or imaginative fabulation than a means of referencing the real world come to the fore. Although many of these ideas have been associated with the so-called post-structuralist thought that emanated from France in the 1970s, variations on them can be discerned still earlier among the generation of Central European emigres who so enriched American intellectual life during the Nazi era and who have continued to exert considerable influence well after they have passed from the scene. As survivors of the pervasive cynicism that pervaded the uh, Weimar Republic, the German Republic of Impostors, as it is often been called, they understood what might ensue once politics became thoroughly discredited. But they also had learned that the antidote was not self-righteous moralizing. In what follows, I want to concentrate on three of these exiles in particular, who in very different ways have helped us to reach a more complex understanding of the relationship between political life and mendacity. The three are Leo Strauss, Theodor W. Adorno, and Hannah Arendt. Their inclusion in the canon of political theorists has in fact had an impact beyond the halls of the academy narrowly construed. This effect is now most self-evident in the case of Leo Strauss a number of whose neoconservative followers have gained considerable influence in the highest reaches of American government during the presidency of George W. Bush. Perhaps most widely remarked of these is former Assistant Secretary of Defense Paul Wolfowitz, who did his doctoral work under Straussians at the University of Chicago and is a major architect of the new recklessness in American foreign policy. One of its chief cheerleaders is William Crystal, the editor of the Weekly Standard, who served in the administration of Bush's father as advisor to Vice President Quayle. Wolfowitz, in particular, is relevant to our theme because of his now notorious admission that the Bush administration's hype of Saddam Hussein's weapons of mass destruction was designed to elicit the strongest possible popular support for a cause whose 
Real motivation, still not very clear, lay elsewhere. For in this moment of candor, he betrayed one of Strauss's most salient assumptions, that the masses need to be manipulated into following their best interests by an elite who are privy to the deeper truths of reality. Leo Strauss, that is, was a believer in the possibility of knowing the truth, including the truth about the type of government that is objectively the best. He insisted that the modern age had lost its bearings because of its descent into relativist historicism, forgetting the truths grounded in a proper understanding of nature, which the ancient philosophers had once possessed. But he also believed, he also believed that the only way to regain them was to maintain a meaningful distinction between the esoteric knowledge of the few and the exoteric knowledge of the many. Implicitly drawing on the experience of exile, Strauss argued that persecution had forced ancient thinkers to mask their true intentions in ways that required deciphering by disciples with the skills to read between the lines. What was a necessity became a virtue when it led to independent thinking, at least for the minority with the talents and tenacity to attempt it. It was for them, for that minority, as he put it in his 1939 essay on the spirit of Sparta or the taste of Xenophon, it was for them, and I quote, a matter of duty to hide the truth from the majority of mankind, end quote. The tradition of esoteric teachings had withered, Strauss claimed, in the Enlightenment, although its decline was already underway when Machiavelli made explicit the techniques of statecraft that the ancients had known must be kept as the private knowledge of rulers alone. The disappearance of the tradition, he lamented, roughly coincided with, quote, the victory of higher criticism and of systems of philosophy which claimed to be sincere, but which certainly lacked moderation, end quote. Liberal notions of an egalitarian public sphere in which transparency and sincerity were the premises of enlightened public opinion were the sorry outcome of this betrayal, according to Strauss. Now Strauss, as might be expected, has been an easy target for defenders of rationalist liberalism as well as egalitarian democracy. And I am myself certainly not inclined to offer a defense of his explicitly hierarchical politics based on an allegedly natural order whose self-evidence neither he nor his disciples have, I think, satisfactorily demonstrated. But what has to be acknowledged is that his animadversions on the dangers of sharing truths with the uncomprehending masses has given legitimacy to the old Platonic idea of the noble lie, the genion uh, pseudos, to an important segment of at least the conservative intellectuals of our day. Now they, of course, would be uh, disinclined to express their scorn for egalitarian democracy explicitly. But it takes no great exegetical skill to read between the lines of their texts and observe their political actions to come to this conclusion. A very different and much more oblique defense of mendacity in politics emerges, however, if we turn to the next figure in our triumvirate whose political agenda was very far from that of Leo Strauss, Theodor Adorno. Now, Adorno, to be sure, also held on to a strong, what he called, emphatic concept of truth, often arguing, for example, for the truth content of works of art against those who see the aesthetic as mere illusion or fabulation. And as a result, he cannot be rightly assimilated to the Nietzschean post-structuralists who take the linguistic turn to the extreme of questioning the capacity of words to refer uh, without uh, any mediation to what exists outside the prison house of language. Nor for all of Adorno's putative elitism and disdain for mass culture would it be correct to identify his position with a cynical defense of philosophy kings who can tell noble lies to the herd unable to see through them. Underlying his radical politics was always a firm belief in the ultimate value of an enlightened democracy with citizens able to cast off the spell of ideological mystification. 
So if Adorno can be said to have contributed to the critique of traditional American notions of political honesty, it would only be indirectly, only through his questioning of the premises of the conventional wisdom about language and truth-telling. Now, Adorno, to be sure, never himself developed a sustained analysis of language, although it has been possible to piece together his thoughts from disparate sources in his vast oeuvre. What stands out is his distrust of easy notions of communicability. Easy notions of communicability, which assume the transparency of the current universe of discourse and the ability of individuals to judge freely for themselves what is fed them by the mass media. In the words of a recent student of the history of the idea of communication, quote, there was no more formidable critic of the commercialized culture of sincerity, end quote, than Theodor Adorno. And as a result, he has come to be positioned in accounts of current debates about obscure academic writing on the left as the anti-Orwell, the champion of the difficult, dense prose, sometimes stigmatized as bad writing, associated with figures like Judith Butler and Homi Baba. Uh, I'm thinking here, for example, of an essay in Lingua Franca five or six years ago by James Miller called, Is Bad Writing Necessary? George Orwell, Theodor Adorno, and the Politics of Language. So Orwell for transparency, Adorno on the side of difficulty, uh, perhaps even uh, inaccessibility and obscurity. Typical of Adorno's skepticism about transparent communicability with the bitter observations, one of the aphorisms in his collection, Minima Moralia, composed around the same time that Orwell wrote his celebrated essays, that is to say, in the mid-1940s. I quote from Minima Moralia, where Adorno says, regard for the object rather than for communication is suspect in any expression. Anything not taken from pre-existent patterns appears inconsiderate, a symptom of eccentricity, almost of confusion. The logic of the day, which makes so much of its clarity, has naively adopted this perverted notion of everyday speech. Few things contribute so much to the demoralization of intellectuals. Those who would escape it must recognize the advocates of communicability as traitors to what they communicate, end quote. The advocates of communicability as traitors to what they communicate. Although agreeing with George Orwell that stale cliches are the enemies of clear thought, Adorno differed from him in stressing the value of difficulty and complexity, which defeated the effortless absorption of prepackaged ideas. He also questioned Orwell's desire to purify language of its ornamental excrescences, in particular foreign words. With a somber awareness of what a similar campaign had meant in the context of the country from which he had escaped from Germany, Orwell Riley noted, quote, the German words of foreign derivation are the Jews of language, end quote. That is, linguistic purification went along with ethnic cleansing of a far more sinister kind. Adorno's suspicion of the agenda behind purifying language of alien intrusions was of a piece with his critique of what he called the jargon of authenticity in a book of that name published in 1964, uh, the Jargon der Eigenlichkeit, the jargon of authenticity. Adorno's ire in that book was directed at the German existentialists, most notably Heidegger and Jaspers, who elevated the values of genuineness, authenticity, and original meaning to normative status above the content of what was believed or meant. Aimed at overcoming the abstractions of, modern, of reified life, they preached a pseudo-concreteness which denied the historical reasons for the depredations of modern culture. In their hands, mere commitment, speaking from the heart, became an antidote to nihilism no matter the cause to which the commitment was dedicated. The individual who makes that commitment is understood in possessive terms as entirely owned by the speaker whose integrity and sincerity are favored over his mimetic, imitative relationship with others in the world. Likewise, language purified of its historical accretions should return to its archaic roots to regain its true meaning. 
Uh, and this is a bit like Orwell's preference for good old Anglo-Saxon words against their uh, effete Latin, uh, Latinate surrogates, although Adorno didn't make the comparison. Already in Minimum Moralia, written during his exile years, Adorno had seen the political implications of the jargon of authenticity, which were frighteningly regressive and xenophobic. The supremacy of the original over the derived, he warned, quote, is always linked with social legitimism. All ruling strata claim to be the oldest settlers, autochthonous, end quote. Along with the striving for ultimate original meaning went the suspicion of ambiguity and rhetoric, which meant a denigration of sophistry in both philosophy and politics. With the assertion of meaning at all costs, Adorno writes, and I'm quoting, with the assertion of meaning at all costs, the old anti-sophistic emotion seeps into the so-called mass society. Now, ancient sophistry, to be sure, had failed to fight against injustice in the name of truth, preferring to ratify whatever was the status quo. But when it is one-sidedly combated in the name of original univocal meanings, sophistry's important insight that language is never fully adequate to objects or concepts either because it can't express their full complexity or because it says more than it means, this great insight is then sacrificed. The same loss is suffered when clarity becomes a fetish, either in philosophy or politics. In an essay entitled, Scotonus or How to Read Hegel, published in 1963, Adorno defended the notorious difficulty and opacity of that most obscure philosopher's style. Uh, the, the term Scotonus, by the way, refers to uh, a work uh, done by Heraclitus, who also is one of the great patrons, we might say, of difficulty in the way that Hegel is. Adorno writes, someone who cannot state what he means without ambiguity is not worth wasting time on. And Adorno here is simply contemptuously characterizing the current orthodoxy. Like the desire for explicit definitions to which it is related, this concept of clarity has survived the Cartesian philosophy in which it originated and has become autonomous, end quote. Its survival, the survival of the fetish for clarity, has led to a preference for stability over flux, as objects are able to be clearly designated only when they stop moving and make themselves available to the scrutiny of the enlightened gaze. Absolute clarity also presupposes a non-dynamic subject, a subject whose use of language is no less reified. Philosophically, like that of Hegel, which incorporates movement into its own thought processes, at least offers some resistance to this condition which is inherent in language itself. Adorno writes, the very form of the copula, the is, pursues the aim of pinpointing its object, an aim to which philosophy ought to provide a corrective. In this sense, all philosophical language is language in opposition to language, marked with the stigma of its own impossibility. Uh, maybe I should pause just to explain that the copula the is when we say A equals or A is something else. There is a, an attempt to create an identity between the two, a fixed definitional identity. And Adorno's point here is that language struggles against uh, its own tendency to create that kind of fixed identity. And instead a language like that of Hegel's or like that of Adorno's, uh, his own language, strives to create a sense of movement which prevents that congealing of an identity. Adorno's critique of straightforward clarity of expression based on the putative identity of word and thing is aimed at philosophical discourse, at least in this essay on Hegel, but it is not hard to see its applicability to the realm of politics as well, where rhetoric, uncertainty, and constant change play even more central roles. Indeed, Bill Clinton's notorious defense of his deception uh, about Monica Lewinsky, that it all depends on, quote, what the meaning of is is, resonates with Adorno's reading of Hegel's refusal to be restricted by the identitarian implications of the copula. Adorno, to be sure, never praised mendacity as an actual virtue in politics. 
nor did he abandon his hope in an emphatic concept of truth that would survive all ideological attempts to assume its mantle in the present. But by alerting us to the ways in which those attempts often hid other agendas, he made us aware that simple appeals to clarity, communicability, authenticity, and integrity could become obstacles to precisely what they purported to defend. In other words, always distrust the politician who tells you that he's speaking from the heart, that he's being sincere, that he's being truthful. These are the ones who are often, in a way, uh, hiding the most. The third figure in our triumvirate, Hannah Arendt, is also the one who most explicitly addressed the role of lying in politics. Personally hostile to both Strauss and Adorno, she also disdained their belief that philosophers like Plato or Hegel had anything to teach those who were active in the realm of politics. The idea of the noble lie, she argued, was not only wrong, but also a misreading of the text in Plato's Republic. Although learning much from the Heidegger and Jaspers excoriated by Adorno as adepts of the jargon of authenticity, she steadfastly resisted their emphasis on the primacy of philosophy. Instead, Hannah Arendt attempted to build a firewall between politics and philosophy. At least if the latter were understood, philosophy were understood as the search for eternal, universal essences rather than contingent plural appearances. In two essays in particular, the first called Truth and Politics of 1967, the second Lying in Politics of 1971, Arendt drew radical conclusions from her idiosyncratic political theory to the issue of mendacity in the public realm. Occasioned by two controversies over lying, the first by her own work on Adolf Eichmann's trial. Eichmann, remember, had been caught by the Israelis and tried for his complicity in the Holocaust in the mid-1960s. The second by the leaking of the so-called Pentagon Papers, papers that were written by the American Pentagon to talk about the truth of the, uh, of the uh, Vietnam War, uh, which were then leaked by uh, Daniel Ellsberg. These two essays provide a more fundamental challenge to the American quest for full disclosure in the public realm than anything written by Strauss and Adorno. Ironically, the first essay was stimulated by the charge that Hannah Arendt had unwisely told the truth herself about the Jewish role in enabling the Holocaust, or more precisely that of the so-called Jewish councils, uh, to the detriment of current political causes. She had, in other words, foolishly followed the dangerous principle of fiat veritas uh, et periat mundus, uh, let truth survive or, or flourish uh, and the world go under. She'd foolishly followed that dangerous principle uh, in telling the truth about the Udenlate of Jewish councils. Without denying that she was dedicated as a scholar to truth-telling, Arendt was moved to ponder the problematic implications of that practice in the political arena. The essay Truth in Politics opens with a direct and unequivocal challenge to the critical evaluation of those uh, effects uh, which we have seen was so powerful a part of the American uh, conventional wisdom. She writes, no one has ever doubted that truth and politics are on rather bad terms with each other. And no one, as far as I know, has ever counted truthfulness among the political virtues. Lies have always been regarded as necessary and justifiable tools, not only of the politicians and demagogues, but also of the statesmen's trade." End quote. Indeed, lying itself was not considered a cardinal sin until modern times. Plato, for example, thought ignorance and error worse than deliberate mendacity. She writes, only with the rise of Puritan morality, coinciding with the rise of organized science, whose progress had to be assured on the firm ground of the, of the absolute veracity and reliability of every scientist, were lies considered serious offenses." End quote. Still, for ancient philosophy, the quest for truth was paramount, a truth that was understood in the Platonic tradition in terms of rational oneness. The realm of politics was far more messy, far more divisive, ruled by sophistic rhetoric, uh, 
and contingent doxa, the Greek word for opinion, rather than dialogic ratiocination. She writes, to the citizens' ever-changing opinions about human affairs, which themselves were in a state of constant flux, the philosopher opposed the truth about those things which were in their very nature were everlasting, and from which, therefore, principles could be derived to stabilize human affairs. Hence, the opposite to truth was opinion, which was equated with illusion." End quote. Rational notions of truth, Hannah Arendt argued, no longer hold much sway in the modern world. But they've been replaced by a belief, by a belief in the truth of facts, which is a much more of a challenge to the political realm. For factual truth is dependent on intersubjective agreement, and therefore is closer to political opinion than to deductive reason. But they're not the same, for all truth claims differ from mere opinion by the way in which they assert their validity which has a moment of coercion in it. She writes, factual truth, like other truth, peremptorily claims to be acknowledged and precludes debate. And debate constitutes the very essence of political life. The modes of thought and communication that deal with truth, if seen from the political perspective, are necessarily domineering. They don't take into account other people's opinions. And taking these into account is the hallmark of all strictly political thinking. Taking other people's opinions is the hallmark of all truly political thought. Political judgment is the ability to incorporate other opinions, producing what Immanuel Kant had called an enlarged mentality, but not the search for the one true opinion not the search for one single true idea. Philosophy is an exercise in searching for a singular truth. Politics is the interplay of plural opinions. Even the self-evident truths that Thomas Jefferson declared to be the justification for declaring American independence and the famous Declaration of Independence were, after all, prefaced by the concession quote that we hold these truths to be self-evident. We hold these truths implying that contingent consent and agreement, the holding of the truth, rather uh, than the coercion of the ideas themselves, was the basis for the claim. There is another consideration, Hannah Arendt continued, that makes lying itself a central dimension of political life. A lie, quote, is clearly an attempt to change the record. And as such, it is a form of action. The liar is an actor by nature. He says what is not so because he wants things to be different, different from what they are. That is, he wants to change the world." End quote. One of the main reasons truthfulness is not a genuine political virtue is that it doesn't produce a desire for change, although, of course, it can contribute to undermining the status quo built entirely of lies. There is, Hanard went on to argue, a tendency in the modern world towards the systematic organized mobilization of lying to create wholly fictitious political worlds, thus the adoption of the so-called big lie in totalitarianism. There is, however, a limit to the capacity of those who organize mendacity to keep truth entirely at bay. Thus, facts as past events, which cannot be entirely effaced, stubbornly resist the construction of a world of total untruth, a world but uh, of big lies. And there are ways in which institutions like the judiciary, which are inside the political arena, and the academy, which are outside, and we can also add uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, free press, uh, which do provide a check on the capacity of political mendacity to build a world entirely out of thin air. Politics, we might say, is a limited realm circumscribed by truths that it cannot undo insofar as they involve a past that cannot be changed. But to the extent that politics involves a possible future, to the extent that it depends on opinions rather than hard facts, to the extent that it traffics in contingencies instead of eternal verities, to the extent that it mobilizes rhetoric rather than deductive logic, and is based on plurality rather than singularity, 
lying cannot be entirely expunged from its precincts. Thus, when it came to responding to the outcry against the mendacity revealed in the Pentagon Papers, Anna Arendt, who had doubts about the foolishness of the American intervention in Vietnam, was in, in a bit of a dilemma. The essay, Lying in Politics, of 1971, begins by rehearsing the argument of her earlier essay. You'll recall what she says there. Here she says, quote, truthfulness has never been counted among the political virtues, and lies have always been regarded as justifiable tools in political dealings. The, the deliberate denial of factual truth, the ability to lie, and the capacity to change facts, the ability to act, are interconnected. They owe their existence to the same source, imagination. Thus, moralizing about mendacity in politics is fruitless, uh, as is the hope that contingent facts can ever achieve indubitable status. But the Pentagon Papers, uh, Hannah Arendt uh, then conceded, introduced something new into the debate about lying in politics. For in addition to lying for the uh, sake of the country's image, those responsible for American intervention were also active problem solvers who prided themselves on the rational, unsentimental nature of their actions. For this reason, they attempted to import scientific reasoning into politics, substituting calculation for political judgment. And then she says, and I'm quoting, what these problem solvers have in common with down-to-earth liars is the attempt to get rid of facts and the confidence that this should be possible because of the uh, inherent contingency of facts, end quote. But to impose their new reality entirely required the wholesale destruction of stubborn facts, which not even totalitarian leaders like Stalin and Hitler could accomplish despite their will to do so. Ultimately, the architects of American foreign policy had to face the consequences of their own deceptions. But ironically, the reason for their downfall was less their reliance on mendacious image making than their mistaken attempt to apply reason, calculative reason, instrumental reason to politics rather than learn from experience. Arendt explains, and I quote, the problem solvers did not judge, they calculated. Their self-confidence did not even need self-deception to be sustained in the midst of so many misjudgments, for it relied on the evidence of mathematical, purely rational truth. Except, of course, that this truth was entirely irrelevant to the problem at hand. So here, instead of being on the opposite side of the fence dividing politics from science, lying and rational theorizing worked hand in hand. Quote, defactualization and problem solving were welcomed because disregard of reality were inherent in the policies and goals themselves. End quote. Now, this last part of the talk has probably been a bit confusing because I think Hannah Arendt's argument here is a little muddled. And in the end, Arendt's attempt to distinguish radically between politics and truth-telling uh, rationalization was thwarted by the complexities of the case before her, just as her other categorical distinctions between the political and the social or the moral were, I think, also perpetually in danger of coming undone. Still, despite the difficulty she had in making a watertight argument for them, her insight into the fatal affinity between politics and mendacity, if added to those we've already encountered in Strauss and Adorno, make a suggestive case against any simple-minded critique of lying in the political realm. For even if one rejects the idea of the platonic noble lie as the elitist contempt for the idea of an enlightened public that I think it is, it is hard to dismiss the insights that Adorno and Arendt both supply into the ways in which language necessarily defeats any attempt to be utterly transparent and univocal in the messy realm of politics. Moreover, if we acknowledge that plural opinion rather than singular truth means that there will always be different interpretations of what is and what should be, we can relax our expectation that the conventional norm of political speech is limpid truthfulness, and that lying is an aberrant uh, deviation. It is, I think, perhaps better to say that spin, exaggeration, evasion, half-truths, and the like, maybe even outright lies, are as much the stuff of political discourse and the struggle for power as straightforward speaking from the heart. As we've come to know from experience, 
primary election opponents defaming their rivals miraculously unite around the victor and sing his praises. Memoirs of statesmen acknowledge the duplicity of their negotiations. Politicians give coyly evasive answers to probing journalists. Laws are deliberately written with ambiguities that I guess only lawyers can love. Campaign promises are given with fingers crossed. Treaties are written in intentionally vague language, allowing each side to claim advantage, and so on and so forth. Although it is certainly the case that the balance between truth-telling and fabrication with all the gray area in between is historically variable, I think historians would be hard-pressed to identify any polity of whatever kind in which perfect veracity was the norm. The fear that we sometimes hear today that images have replaced substance or that the aestheticization of politics is a new departure ignores, I think, the extent to which politics, rhetoric, and even theatricality have always been intimate bedfellows. It also underestimates the extent to which the logic of politics is modal rather than propositional. That is, dealing with promises, dealing with plans about the future rather than statements about what is currently the case, with what should or ought to be rather than simply matters of fact. In addition, it fails to see that persuasion often works in politics through the power of narratives. Narratives, which as the historian Hayden White has made clear in the case of history in general, are always as much implanted via figural tropes as referentially true. And insofar as such narratives always find their endpoint in a putative future, either to be realized or avoided, they contain an even stronger imaginative moment, a moment of fabulation, than is the case with those dealing only with the past. Still another consideration is the role played by myth, or at least conceptual fabrication, and underlying even the most seemingly transparent of politics. One need, need not go all the way with a Georges Sorel, the great uh, French political theorist, to acknowledge that even non-redemptive politics is based on certain notions that would not easily bear close epistemological scrutiny. Take, for example, the idea of national interest, which is so often mobilized as a cover for partial interest masking as general. Or even more fundamentally, consider the idea of the people, an enormously elastic term whose boundaries are never very precise and whose exclusions are rarely acknowledged. Those who claim to speak in the name of the national interest or the people are not necessarily lying. They may intend to represent the common interest those terms purport to embody. But a politics that is based on this kind of legitimation necessarily introduces a mythic moment into its discourse. Now, all of this <coughs> is not to say, of course, that truth-telling and wariness about falsehoods should simply be banished from the political realm, which is nothing but a contest of competing lies. I don't want to be understood as arguing that. Strauss and Adorno, as we've seen, hold on to an emphatic notion of truth, which stands apart from normal political life, while Hannah Arendt admits that at least factual truth is an inherent part of any political discourse. It would indeed be dangerous to allow cynicism to undermine entirely the indignation that should accompany any disclosure of outright deception. What it does suggest, however, and I want to argue this in conclusion, is that rather than seeing the big lie of totalitarian politics as met by the perfect truth sought in liberal democratic ones, a truth based on that quest for transparency and clarity we've seen endorsed by George Orwell and his earnest followers, we would be better advised to see politics as the endless struggle between lots of little lies, lots of half-truths, lots of competing narratives, which may offset each other, but never entirely produce a single consensus, a single political truth. Although it is certainly the case that veridical discourses, such as the judicial, where participants are sworn to tell the truth the whole truth and nothing but the truth, do intersect with politics at crucial moments, as, say, Bill Clinton can well attest, they never entirely subsume it. In fact, the great irony of the goal of absolute truth and truthfulness 
is that in a way it mirrors the big lie and total mendacity of the totalitarianism it is designed to thwart. Both endanger the plurality of opinions and interminability in the fallible process of agonistic human interaction that has come to be called politics. Both enforce orthodoxy, the making straight of heterogeneous and unruly doxa, opinion. Lots of little competing fabrications, ironically, may ward off that enforcement more effectively than any attempt to establish and defend a single, universally shared truth. Now, these lessons have, I think, begun to permeate into our political consciousness. Although it would be wrong to exaggerate the effect of the three foreign-born theorists I've discussed uh, in what is perhaps the most uh, influential general study of Mendacity in recent years, Cicela Bach's book, Lying, Moral Choice in Public and Private Life. Strauss and Adorno are not uh, mentioned, while Arendt's essay on truth and politics is cited only in passing, and then, in fact, with total disregard for its main argument. Although it would be wrong to exaggerate their effect, it's at least arguable that they have provided us the tools to think more deeply than before about the issue. But let the last word go to another defender of the virtues of mendacity from abroad, to the great playwright and uh, wit Oscar Wilde. In his famous essay of 1889, the imagined dialogue called The Decay of Lying, Wilde has one of his interlocutors denounce with mock horror the effects on American culture of our exemplary founding anecdote, the anecdote about George Washington and the cherry tree. He writes, it is not too much to say that the story of George Washington and the cherry tree has done more harm and in a shorter span of time than any other moral tale in the whole of literature, end quote. And then he adds, with a brilliant irony for which only Oscar Wilde uh, can, I think, be justly celebrated, quote, and the amusing thing is that the story of the cherry tree is itself an absolute myth. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias <coughs> al doctor Martin J. por esa espléndida plática y él responderá, si ustedes quieren, algunas de sus preguntas que se formulen. Tenemos un solo micrófono para ello. Así es que si alguien tiene una, lo pueda hacer. ¿Alguien quisiera formular una pregunta? Go ahead. Tenemos una ahí. Bien. Bien, para empezar, eh, pues una felicitación al doctor Martin Jay. Muy interesante el tema de que toca de la violencia, sobre todo eh, en el sentido de que en, en México vivimos una situación bastante difícil en cuanto a lo, lo que es la violencia. Eh, básicamente mi pregunta sería, hablando de, de, esta, de esta relación que varios autores ma, eh, manejan acerca de la violencia, ¿en qué lugar queda la sociedad civil, que es parte fundamental para el sostenimiento y para la creación de esta misma violencia, que muchas veces es eh, manejada de cierta manera por los medios de, de comunicación. Uh, the question of violence is a very interesting one. Um, all polities, uh, all societies uh, contain uh, 
uh, a moment of coercion, a moment uh, of ultimate violence, which they uh, sometimes exercise uh, infrequently, at other times exercise, alas, all too frequently. Uh, one might argue that there is a continuity between lying and violence, that violence is a form of uh, not persuading, but rather forcing, coercing someone to do uh, what uh, the person who has the power to exercise the violence wants. And one might argue that lying also is a form of coercion, uh, coercion that is subtle, indirect, produced by uh, mystification, by preventing you from knowing the truth, by preventing you from knowing what I really feel. So that lying and mendacity on the one hand and violence on the other are part of a bad politics, whereas truth-telling and an open public sphere are part of a good politics. There's a lot, I think, to be said for that. However, it is also possible to argue that hypocrisy in politics, a certain kind of, let's say, uh, shared lying, is on the side of anti-violence. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that is that coalitions are formed in politics, collaborations are created among people with very, very different interests, with very different values, uh, sometimes even competing and oppositional interests and values. How are these coalitions built? Well, they sometimes are built by reaching compromises. They sometimes are reached uh, by creating a general will uh, through uh, rational discourse, what somebody like Jürgen Habermas would argue is the essence of politics. On other occasions, they are created by a kind of nonviolent hypocrisy, in which I tell you something which makes you collaborate with me, you tell me something that makes me want to collaborate with you. In a way, I know that you're sugarcoating uh, the, uh, the concept uh, that, uh, that I will follow, that there's some way in which we know that we are both using each other, and yet we're able to achieve a kind of collaboration which avoids violence. So hypocrisy under certain circumstances is a way to create a kind of, let's say, unstable and temporary coalition of people who are nonetheless opposed. The great example of this in world politics in the 20th century was the alliance to defeat Hitler. If you took Churchill, Stalin, and Roosevelt uh, and asked them if they believed the same things, if they supported the same ideas, if they had the same ultimate politics, they obviously would have said no. They were hypocritical in creating a kind of alliance against the Nazis, against the Japanese. And it was a useful hypocrisy. It was a useful series, we might say, of lying, which of course ultimately broke down after the defeat of Hitler, and then the Cold War allowed the real interests to emerge. So that in a complicated way, we might say that a certain civility in politics is maintained by a kind of tacit hypocrisy in which a certain, let's say, proportion of the relations among collaborators involves shading the truth so that we will uh, achieve a kind of tentative agreement, which may then break up in the future, which allows us in the present to fight with a common enemy. And so collaboration even within a party, as well as between parties, and certainly between countries, often involves a kind of willingness to uh, allow lying to emerge. And that, oddly enough, will avoid violence rather than help to abet it. So I think that's, that's part of the answer that I think we'll give to a very important question. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes, este, soy José Trejo, estudio Relaciones Internacionales. Y bueno, el, el, la pregunta va con un pequeño preámbulo. Eh, hemos encontrado que su ponencia o el análisis de su ponencia hizo alusión a, a teóricos emigrados de Europa y bueno, en, en, la, la ponencia en sí eh, se basa en, en, en el análisis de la realidad política americana, ¿no? Nor norteamericana, estadounidense. Pero bueno, pasando por ejemplo tra o, o traslapando esta, este análisis a la política mexicana, a la, a la historia política mexicana, encontramos que, que bueno, la mentira ha formado parte esencial o si no ha construido el, la, la realidad política. Entonces, la pregunta es, ¿qué pasa? O ¿Qué pasa cuando la mentira ya no es parte del discurso o, o de la lucha entre las pequeñas verdades y pequeñas mentiras de la que usted, con la que usted concluía su, su ponencia, sino ya se convierte en el discurso completo? Entonces, la veracidad ya no existe, o por lo menos eh, ahorita en tiempos electorales en México, eh, los discursos de los candidatos presidenciales 
bueno, pues a, para muchos eh, ya no nos parecen siquiera eh, con, con verdaderos o con, con algún resquicio de, de, de veracidad, ¿no? Eh, esa sería la pregunta. ¿Qué pasa? Uh, it's always extraordinarily interesting to uh, present this kind of material in different contexts. And I've lectured uh, on the subject uh, in a variety of different places uh, around the world. And it's quite clear that everywhere people distrust their politicians and say they lie. In other words, everywhere there is a sense that politics is the realm of mendacity. The United States has been, over the years, somewhat naive, somewhat innocent in the way that I try to argue at the beginning of the paper. Uh, but despite that, if you look at the uproar about lying that exists today in the United States concerning the weapons of mass destruction, only five years ago people were also in an uproar about Clinton's lying about Monica Lewinsky. Five years or ten years before that it was Reagan and Iran-Contra. Ten years before that it was Vietnam and the Pentagon. In other words, there are always these rhythms of people being outraged by lying in politics. So, Once you recognize that, you realize that there is always in politics some degree of lying as well as some degree of outrage, some degree of uh, a kind of uh, sense that we're being betrayed by the lies, but never a politics of absolute, complete, full transparency, full clarity, full truth. So what I think we need to recognize is that we have various institutions which help us to distinguish between types of lies uh, and a, let's say, residual quantity of truth which exists in the public realm. Those institutions include a free press, that if you get rid of a free press, then it is really, really problematic to deal with lies. You also need, obviously, a free uh, university uh, sphere, an academic sphere, a sphere of intellectual life, in which it's possible for intellectuals to uh, call into question political uh, lies, political judgment, without fearing for their uh, survival. You also need a free judiciary. And now, uh, here, judiciary might be seen as part of the political realm, but to the extent that it is outside it and has a certain independence, it too can be a place in which the lies of politics are judged. So politics itself is not an absolutely watertight realm. The types of hypocrisy or mendacity or lies or half-truths or spin in politics are always available for an external review by these other types of institutions. And our freedoms are dependent on keeping politics uh, in a way responsible because of these other institutions. When politics begins to dominate, then you have the threat of totalitarianism, the threat of the big lie, the threat of a totally fictional world in which there are no exterior institutions like the judiciary, Uh, or the academy, or a free press, which can judge. And then you get really uh, into trouble. But in the political realm, we learn also to be wise consumers of the lies that are told. We know that our own side tells lies. We know that our own side exaggerates. We know that the promises that our own side makes are promises that will not be fully kept. Uh, and we then sometimes are disappointed, and four years later, six years later, eight years later, we vote out the people we voted for because we feel betrayed by their promises. But we also know the promises of the people we elect the next time will also be betrayed, that it is in a way the nature of politics to exaggerate what we can do as politicians. So that in some sense, politics is a kind of game, is a theater. Uh, the idea of playing politics, the idea of politics as a kind of spectacle, the idea of politics as a contest uh, which is like a sporting event, All that is something which defines the political realm uh, in a way that allows us to see the theatrical dimension uh, of it, uh, the dimension that ties it to rhetoric and ties it to orations of great uh, speech that involve rhetoric and so forth. So I think those are the ways in which uh, all political uh, uh, realms, uh, all political systems, uh, have a space for mendacity and also a space for telling the truth. So all of what I was saying is not a defense of absolute lying by any means, because The very notion of a lie is dependent on the uh, prior notion of truth-telling. Uh, when we are children and are taught to tell the truth, we're taught to tell our parents whether or not we really have a cookie behind our backs and are going to eat it, we're also told at the same time uh, that under certain circumstances we should in fact lie, that uh, we should be polite, uh, we should uh, thank everybody who gives us a gift even if we hate the gift we're given.
Uh, we should tell Uncle Harry when he comes to dinner that uh, he doesn't have a big nose. Uh, we should, in other words, there are all types of things that we are taught to do to create uh, sociability and politeness. And we are able to tell the difference in ways. So the uh, very complicated calculus between truth telling and lying, between sociability and hypocrisy and being utterly frank and candid is one that we've learned in our everyday lives and we also exercise in politics. Sorry, sorry. Tienes que repetir. Bueno, ok. Eh, Miguel Alejandro Guerra de Relaciones. Eh, viendo la verdad eh, como una especie, más bien desde un concepto más profundo, como una especie de moral maestra. Su creación y reproducción siempre ha estado dentro de las élites y eh, esta verdad ha sido suplantada por medio de la violencia como lo demuestra la historia por, en las revoluciones, eh, dando, proceso, dando pie a un proceso cíclico en el cual las mentiras se convierten en verdades hasta que llega una nueva especie de élite y las derroca. ¿Esto seguirá siendo un proceso cíclico o cree usted que seguirá siendo un proceso cíclico y si es así, cómo terminar con este proceso cíclico de verdad, mentira y violencia? Gracias. Uh, I think it's very difficult to uh, ever uh, assume that there will be an end point uh, to uh, this kind of public uh, display of, uh, let's call it half lies, hypocrisy, strategic use of language and rhetoric. Uh, and that we will ever reach a point of absolute truth in politics or truthfulness what we might call veridiction, the saying of truth on the part of people who enter the public realm. And I think in a way this is a good thing. Because what a single truth in politics would mean, what a single consensus would mean, would be the death of political imagination. The death of the capacity to believe that things could be different, could be better, could be other. And also the death of the plurality of opinions, the death of the multiplicity of values, the death of what we might call cultural um, variety that allows politics to be a space for difference, a space for uh, sometimes agreement, but sometimes argument and disagreement uh, about what uh, we do not share as well as what we do share. Now, the crucial point is to avoid the violent uh, coercion uh, that occurs when one party in that uh, multiplicity of opinion wants to enforce his or her own opinion on everybody else. So if we have learned ultimately that it's an endless game that will never achieve a final death-like state of perfect utopian uh, uh, unity, then we perhaps uh, are no longer quite as compelled to coerce other people into accepting our own opinions. Uh, so in some ways I think it is endless, it is cyclical, uh, whether or not this will lead to greater or worse violence is a somewhat separate question because violence itself is a very complicated issue having to do with the technological multiplication of violence that allows a very small uh, number of people to inflict enormous violence on the rest of uh, the world. So that uh, violence uh, now with nuclear and other types of technologies uh, is in the hands of a very small number of people. And that's an enormously difficult thing for us to deal with. Uh, so that's an issue that has a lot, uh, you know, there's something to do with uh, the, uh, the modern technology of violence uh, more than it does with political lying. Uh, I, I, I'm not sure how they fit together, but I think that's a somewhat different issue. And I think. Siguiente. Bueno, mi nombre es Paola Jiménez, mi pregunta es la siguiente. De pronto, cuando uno está en este panorama de, de descreencia, este, ya no sabe discernir entre lo que es verdad y lo que es mentira. ¿Cómo lograr una visión crítica en una sociedad donde los medios de comunicación juegan un papel legitimador de las mentiras? Uh, I mean, I said before that a free press uh, is a crucial check on a politics of total mendacity. But then the question is, how free is the press? Uh, 
uh, whether or not the mass media is controlled by large corporate interests or by governmental interests or by religious interests or interests that are in a way an extension of the propaganda of a particular uh, party or a religious group or uh, a powerful economic group. And uh, this is a very, very difficult question. In Jürgen Habermas's, Jürgen Habermas's famous book on the structural transformation of the public sphere, a book which argued for a rational public sphere in a way that I'm not perhaps in this talk, he claimed that the modern uh, mass media had destroyed uh, the possibility or undermined to a great extent the possibility of rational discourse. And in fact, the mass media was a media of ideological mystification. Uh, he backtracked a bit from that. And I think it's probably true that we do have now so many media channels, so many opportunities through the internet and other types of new technologies for uh, a kind of media from below, a media that is the media of subversion or the media of the marginal, or the media of those who are not corporate uh, powerhouses to achieve a kind of public that it is now no longer possible to control uh, the media in the singular way that it might have been uh, at a certain point in Western history. Uh, there are still great challenges. For example, uh, very recently, uh, the Chinese government was able to suppress uh, the uh, Google uh, server from uh, allowing uh, some of the information on the internet to get into China. And in the United States, there was a great anxiety raised by the capacity of a government like that of China to suppress uh, a seemingly free institution like uh, Google or Yahoo or these other institutions, uh, which allow China to decide what is uh, available, what isn't to its populace. So it's always a, a great danger. But my feeling is that uh, once having tasted a uh, plurality of different media outlets, most populations are very, very eager to uh, have uh, the opportunity through cable television channels, radio channels, internet channels, all types of newspapers, to go outside of the single voice mass media. Uh, there are some counter uh, countries like Italy today where Berlusconi seems to have a pretty strong uh, grasp of the media. But I think in Mexico or the United States, we're not at the point where the mass media controls us. And we have also learned to be deeply critical of it. So I, I'm, in a way, cautiously optimistic about the future of the mass media, however much uh, it is seen as controlled or manipulated uh, or in the hands of powerful interests. Maybe too optimistic.